We're going to continue our message series that we recently started on prayer, communication with our God. And this week, we're basically going to finish what we started last week. We're going to be in John 17 again. And we began looking at Jesus as a model for prayer. And we looked at the first five verses, which uh, were Jesus's prayer uh, to be glorified. And we're going to go this week and look at sort of the next chunk of that, um, which is simply Jesus's prayer for his disciples. And I think there's some important things for us to pull out of that and learn uh, what is this whole thing of communication with our God. And if we're modeling after Jesus, what does that look like? All right, so let's go ahead and pray. It'd be a good thing to do during a prayer series. And we're just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and and be with us and, and to be our teacher. Jesus, we just welcome you. We know that you're here. You you live in those of us who are your followers. You are present and active and working. But we just invite more of your reality, that you would uh, show up and show out in ways that are tangible. We invite you to teach us. We invite you to breathe upon your word. You said that when your word goes out, it won't return void. It will do what it's sent to accomplish. And so I'm just asking you, Jesus, that You would even speak through me the things that I've prepared and that you've laid on my heart, that you would uh, enable me by your grace to speak those truths and that uh, what folks would hear would be your voice more than mine. Thank you for everyone. and Thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we started with a quote uh, last time, and we're going to do that again um, because I've been trying to kind of pull on different... um, not necessarily historical figures. I mean, I, I was alive when this quote was from, so I can't say that it's from a long time ago. Uh, but Larry Lee uh, was uh, formerly, he's retired now from what I understand, but at the time, uh, 1984, 5, 6, somewhere in there, what had founded and pastored a church called Church on the Rock in Rockwall, Texas. And Uh, If you were to study the history of that particular church, it could easily be said this was a church that was birthed out of prayer. Prayer was was significant, and Pastor Larry's uh, teaching on prayer was foundational to the church. And in uh, some of the materials that I'm working from, he was quoted, and I, I love this quote. He said, prayer is probably the highest calling that anyone could receive. After all, we're joining in a communication that has gone on forever between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice the key thing there is that we are not starting a communication, we are joining a communication. We know that that the Trinitarian God, the, the Godhead three in one, has existed for all time. He is... Yesterday, today, forever. But within himself, he has communication. He has community. He has friendship. He has a million other things that we could say. But this communication between the Father and the Son and the Spirit has been going on for all time. And so our opportunity is to join in that communication. We're not, it's it's like if we were, you know, we're on Facebook and you're, you're in a comment thread I know Facebook's probably not like the cutting edge thing. Again, I'm not. I had a conversation with Rory this morning about young and old, and I'm slipping further and further away from the young category. But that's okay. If you're in a, a in a comment thread, you know somebody posts a question or a comment, and there's then there's discussion that goes on. And it's like invariably in these conversations, sometimes someone will bring up that it's like that has nothing to do with the thing we're talking about. So you might suggest to that person or an administrator or might say, why don't you start a new thread? You know, this seems off topic. Why don't you go over here and start a new thread about that thing that you want to talk about? We need to realize that in prayer, we are trying to join in on the thread that's already been going on for all of eternity and that will continue. We're not trying to start a new thread. When we come to Jesus in prayer, We're joining in, and we're going to explore more about what that looks like um, today and next week. 
But I just wanted to sort of set that context up, that we are joining in a communication that has gone on forever. Let's go ahead and go to Jesus' prayer for his disciples in John 17. Uh, I'll have these on the screen for you. We're going to start in verse 6. John 17, verse 6. And of course, that's the page that wants to stick to its name. There we go. Verse 6, Jesus says, I have revealed you. He's talking to his Father, of course. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. That's a reference to his, his disciples, those that were close to him. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. I'm just going to reference that back to something we said before, that faith is, is a gift, and he's referencing that here again. Everything that Jesus had that he brought, it was, it was a gift from the Father. The fact that Jesus came and all the things that he brought with him, the realities that he brought with him, the faith to believe, all these different things, they were gifts from the Father. Okay, uh, for sake of time, because we've got a lot to cover, let's skip down to verse 11. He, he goes on and he says, Now I am departing from the world. And they, again referencing the disciples, are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united as we are. We're going to pause there for a moment. Jesus, this is his, his request for his disciples. Protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united as we are. Again, he's referencing that reality that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in unity. They are in communication, but they are unified in that communication. In other words, they're on the same page. They're, they're on the same thread. They're, they're all discussing and talking about the same topic. And he's asking that if his disciples could be protected, if the father would look out for them like a good father would do, and, and it, this is one of the keys to the way Jesus prays, he knows what the answer is. He's not saying, well, gee, I really hope, gosh, I wish, if you would please. No, he knows that it's the father's good pleasure to give him that desire of his heart. He knows, let me say it this way, we will notice in the way that Jesus prays when he has a request, and requests are valid. I'm not saying we don't. We do ask for things. That's a valid form of prayer. But when Jesus prays and, and makes a request of the Father, he typically has a basis on which he understands that that should be granted. It, it's not the kind of question that we would often do where we're questioning. And those are also valid. If you're confused, ask the Father. You know, I'm not, I'm not, but, but when we're talking about, he, Jesus is asking him to do something. He's asking the Father to make a difference. He's asking that on the basis that he knows that the Father wants to do that because he's in unity with the Father. He already has gained an understanding of, it is in line with the Father's will that my disciples would be protected and that they would be united just as you and I are united. Protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Now, I do want to say, when you dig into this, the, the word power is not actually in the original Greek text, but it seems to have been added to try to amplify the meaning of that idea of protecting. That, that not only is he asking to, for them to be protected, but he's also recognizing it's within your power. Father, your strong right arm is capable of accomplishing this task. And I'm asking on that basis that you have the ability to do this. All right, let's go down to verse 15. And we're going to go on through uh, in another few verses. 15, so I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Again, I'm referencing back things that we said before. How often do we, do we do that? We run into a problem or an obstacle or, or a trial or a tribulation, and it's like, God, get me out of here. You know, or, or move this thing out of the way. I don't want to deal with this. 
Jesus says, I'm not asking you, and, and we know the rest of the story, right? We can read the lives of the disciples. It was not an easy road. It wasn't all, as I like to say, sunshine and rainbows. But Jesus says, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. And here he's referencing the, the, the Lord's Prayer in Psalms 23. Uh, we're not going to dive into that, but keep them safe from the evil one. In other words, keep them grounded. That, that unity, that see these things build on each other. That unity of communication and intimate relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit immersing in that reality is part of what helps protect. Now, I, I, I want to be really clear here. I don't think, I'm saying I think, that I'm not, this is, but my best interpretation of this, Jesus is not saying keep them safe, meaning uh, stop the enemy from tempting them. Because often, again, that's, that's what we would want. Well, to be safe means I'm not tempted anymore. Well, the enemy hasn't fully been dealt with. We can't, like, take that off the table. So I don't think Jesus' prayer for his disciples is keep the evil one away. No, because truth be told, oftentimes when the enemy tries to come against, that's where God in his bigness, in his sovereignty, in his greatness, actually can use that thing that the enemy meant for destruction for further glory. For further, uh, we're going to touch on some words uh, next week. Sanctification. We're, and if you're not familiar with that language, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, he's praying, keep them safe from the evil one. So that doesn't mean that temptation's not going to come. It means keep them rooted and grounded in me so that they can be tempted and just like I, me, meaning Jesus, they don't yield to that temptation. It says Jesus was tempted in every way and yet he did not sin. He didn't allow the wiles of the devil, the deceptions, the distractions, the various things that were thrown at him to cause him to break his communion relationship with the Father and the Spirit. And that's his prayer for the disciples. Keep them safe. Keep them in intimate communion with yourself. Going on in verse 16, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. I don't know about you, but I, I take comfort in that. Because we know that Jesus didn't belong to the world. Jesus demonstrated that he didn't belong to the world. He clearly was in the world, and we know that call is extended to us, to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus says, they don't belong to the world any more than I do. He's, he's putting us on, on level playing ground here. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. And this is where we're going to begin to touch on that word sanctification. Make them holy could also be said sanctify them, set them apart, make them altogether different. In other words, the reality of them not being of this world, make, make that more real, make that more evident. Make them entirely set apart, altogether different in the ways that I am. Living by the voice and the will of the Father, doing the Father's business. And he says, do that. Teach them your word, which is truth. And we have told you before, you can swap that out. That's Jesus, right? It's not just the written word. It's the person of Jesus who is the perfect picture and representation of the heart and will of the Father. That's why Jesus could say, follow me, because he was... So it's again, it's that inviting into something that's already. Jesus is not saying, Follow me, the Father's finally released me, and I'm I'm going over here and I want you to come with me. He's not starting a new thing, he's not starting a new thread. Jesus is saying, I have this communion going on with the Father and with the Spirit. And you know, we have we have some purposes that we want to accomplish on the earth. And I'm saying to you, follow me. Come join in on this thing that we've got going. It's not just the relationship, it's not just the communion, but we have purposes. We have purposes to redeem humanity, to redeem creation, to set things back to right. And Jesus is saying, follow me in that direction. Join me in what the Father is doing. Join me in what the Father is saying. And part of doing that is being taught by truth. 
taught by Jesus was good for us. Okay. So just to summarize this little section of Scripture that we've been in. Jesus' prayer for his disciples. Now there's more there, but the three things that we're focusing on. Protected in God's name. God being three in one, Trinity. Saved from the enemy and made holy or sanctified by truth. Excuse me. This is Jesus' prayer for his disciples. Now, I want you to notice something. None of these prayers for his disciples are about convenience. They're all focused on the reality of what the Father is doing, who the Father is. Being invited into that unity. See, that's one of the focuses overall it, when we read this entire passage. And, we're, and w if you uh, want to, on your own time, go and read the, the last portion of this chapter, is Jesus' prayer for all who would believe, which extends out to all of us. And one of the themes of that is that we would be united. See, part of what being sanctified, being made holy, being set apart is, we have to find something to unify about that we can all agree on. Because I don't know about you, but if we start polling different uh, things, I'll just say things, we're probably not going to find very many that we can all wholeheartedly agree on. But if we can agree that joining up with the reality of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, purposes and communication that's been going on, if we can agree that that's probably the main thing, maybe we can all go in that direction in unity. And it doesn't mean that there's not room to have healthy disagreements, to have different interpretations of secondary things. I don't think that's nearly as important as we sometimes make it. But if we make the main thing the main thing, I think we will be unified. If we make the preeminence of Jesus Christ and joining his mission and his reality the main thing, I think we can probably unify around that. If, if, if that's not something you can rally around, uh, you might not be in the right room. You know, I think for those of us who love Jesus, who are following him, we can probably agree about that, and we can probably get on board with that reality and that mission. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, verse 18 real quick. Jesus is continuing to pray. This is the end of sort of this section of his prayer for the disciples. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. Again, he's modeling. Father sent him, he sends the disciples, which by association includes us. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. This, this big fancy word of, of sanctification or being made holy or being set apart, it's not something we can do on our own. It's not even a principle or a concept that we can learn and like apply to our life like an afterthought. The reality of sanctification is that it's a process that only comes about in relationship, in relationship with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In other words, we can't become more like Jesus by learning about Jesus and then trying to do it. Only become more like Jesus by getting closer, closer, and closer, trying to live in that truth. And there's this wonderful thing that happens. The closer you get to Jesus, not only the more you see, but the more it affects you. The more time you spend in close proximity to the one you're trying to be like, the more you will become like him. How many of you uh, are familiar with this uh, phrase from, from um, the business world. You will be the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. Now there's you know, things we could say in there about getting our kids to have good friends, and you know, I'm not saying those lessons are not there, but, but there is a reality that who you spend time with, and I, I have to add the dis dis disclaimer, we're talking about quantitative and qualitative time. We're not talking about isolation. 
right? If we carry the light, we have to go to dark places. So I'm, it's actually probably true that we should probably all have more friends that are further away from Jesus. But if this concept of who you spend the most, the most time with, you become more like, maybe we should figure out how to spend more time with Jesus, how to move from visitation to habitation, how to move from I start and stop prayer at these times to prayer is just my life. Prayer is the reality that I live in, this ongoing relationship with Jesus. One of the phrases from the early days of the vineyard that I found really helpful as we begin thinking about this type of prayer is the way in is the way on. Now, what does that mean? The way in is the way on. It's talking about if we're trying to figure out how we're going to get where we're going, how are we going to get on with the mission, how are we going to get on with what we're doing, what we're called to, who we're meant to be, how we even do church, all the questions of life. How are we going to get on with it? Um, I, I have to pause. I, if you know me well, I tend to be a strategic planner. One of the potential downfalls of being a strategic planner is you can plan, 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 adjust the plan, and edit the plan, and talk about the plan. None of that is doing the plan, okay? Sometimes you need to just get on with it. Sometimes, as imperfect as the plan may be, and I may not quite be satisfied with it, but sometimes you just need to get on with it. You just need to have a great little book on my bookshelf called Just Do Something. Some of you can identify with this analysis paralysis. Like, you know, you want to you analyze and plan so much that you don't ever... Okay, so this is what we're talking about. How do we get on with it? The way to get on with it is to go in. Into the presence and the reality of this Father, Son, Holy Spirit reality and communication. Everything that I'm able to accomplish in life and ministry becomes possible because I'm going in. I'm, I'm, I'm investing. I'm spending time. I'm immersing myself. I'm opening myself up. I'm going, and again, I'm struggling with language for this. We're not talking about going into the little imaginary room, because I don't know how else to illustrate this. You know, it's like Jesus is in this little imaginary room, and we're going to go in there and visit him. No. We're not called to visit him. We're called to live a lifestyle of like, what's that phrase about praying without ceasing? Does that mean signing up for, you know, 24-hour slots to come down to church and kneel on the front row and pray out loud? That's probably not what it's talking about. It's probably talking about living in a reality that you're so immersed in what he is, that it's just, it's just part of your life, that you're able to, to function, you're going on with life because this is not an activity that we add on as a bonus. It's, it's a way of living. It's a reality that's different than just the things that we see and touch and see. So the way in is the way on. The number one thing that you can learn about prayer is that we need to align our prayers with what is already being prayed by Father, Son. Now I say align, I'm not talking about copying or just saying rote things, but going into that reality, into the reality of His presence and letting Him transform us, letting Him lead us, letting Him guide us, that is the way on. I want to remind you of our definition from the beginning of the series of what prayer is overall. Prayer is open, honest, and personal communication with our God. Remember that, that's that personal aspect. He's, he's our God. He's not a God. He is the God. He is God Almighty, but He's also personal. He's, he's our God. And He has a communication that's going, and He's inviting us to join it. 
I want to touch on one more scripture, and this will sort of set us up for where we're going next week, but it'll also wrap us up for today. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. See, God, God is seated on a throne. He is all the things that we could say and think and sing about being the king of heaven, about being majestic, being glorious, being far above, being set apart, being God above all God. All of that reality is true, and yet he allows us to have the kind of relationship where we're actually welcome in his inner court. We're actually welcome to approach the throne. And you don't have to have an appointment. You don't have to have an escort. You don't have to have like a middle person to to mediate the communication between you and God. You, as a son or daughter of the Most High God, have free, unfettered, privileged access to go right into the throne room You don't even have to stand on the little spot where the peasants would stand. You can actually go right up the steps and you can climb up in his lap and say, hey, daddy, I need something. Can you talk to me about this? And you know what? It doesn't actually matter in that moment what else is going on in the kingdom. He's your daddy. He's your papa. And he has given you that access. It is his high privilege and honor to welcome you into the inner court, into the very throne room, Where all of the, like, do you understand this? The whole cosmos of all creation hinges on what happens in that place. Like, he's king over all of it. It's all of the universe. It's everything that exists, exists out of the words that he speaks. And yet, he invites you in. He says, come right on up here. Climb up in my lap. Tell me what you need. Join in what the Father and the Spirit and I have going on. That's the way it is.